Okay, uh, welcome back to another episode of Browns Bites. And uh, the triumphant Browns are undefeated, uh, 1-0, having defeated the Cincinnati Bengals 24-3, to uh, winning in pretty dominant fashion. Uh, it took a while to get there, but after, once they did, it sort of rolled over. You know, there was no there was no doubt who the better team was at the end of that game. Um, certainly, weather was a factor, uh, but uh, it, we'll get into it. But I, but to me, I felt like my initial impression is whether the rain, whether it was weather there or not, the Browns were going to just dominate that game the way it was played. A, a good win overall, and certainly everything we needed. In fact, Bree may have spoken spoken it into existence by saying, "Just find a way to win." I don't care if it's ugly. And we, what we got was a whole lot of ugly offensive football, uh, but uh, a lot of good stuff on defense. Yeah. So number one, I went to our show on Friday in a collared shirt. I told you I was serious, feeling serious about things. We couldn't have been more right in everything that we said. So True. just, just you know, just like to put that out there. I'm feeling very cocky today. That This, this victory is just... Um, um, marinating on two days worth of just overconfidence and being out of contain. So I'm there. I'm I'm there, people. It took one game to get me there. Today it didn't even take the it didn't even take the <laughs> game. It was done. It did. Yes, it did. I was so uneasy all weekend, just full of anxiety. Uh so today I show up to Pete with a notebook full of notes, which again I'm would like to reiterate I'm out of contain. Pete, I, my feelings definitely fluctuated depending on the quarter that we were watching unfold. Uh, I didn't feel super confident uh, in the first or the second quarter really at all. And I was starting to mentally prepare myself for, oh gosh, we're going to somehow find a way to blow this. And we're going to have to listen to terrible people calling into the radio, talking about how we need to sell the farm and fire everyone and get rid of every asset that we have. And meanwhile, while our former quarterback was on yes. his way to winning. Yes. I, I, and that and looking, definitely like, occurred so, to me. So, yeah. So like as all of these things were unfolding in real lifetime, I, I, I seriously was sitting there mentally preparing like tweets, getting in the drafts of like, I really feel for any any Cleveland sports talk radio host this week of what they're going to have to deal with, with callers. So I'm so happy that obviously things turned around. Um, and P and I were just chatting before we were coming on the show. And for me, the longer the game went on, the more comfortable I felt, particularly with the defense. And I know we will get into it. But it was such a a weird feeling and sensation of starting to feel like things weren't doomed when the offense got stalled or something happened, even turnovers that happened, where there was this faith that the defense was going to come through, make a stop, get off the field. And that's something that we just really haven't experienced. Yeah, Um since the Browns started on defense, it took me three plays to be like, okay, the defense is good. The defense is going to be just That's fun. all it took. Yeah. Three <laughs> three plays was it. Like Zadarius Smith, Waxboro, they uh they they stopped the next play and then you know, Miles Garrett charges through in uh Okoronko sacks. I'm like, we'll be fine on this side of the ball. Now it took a while offensively to get things going and and, and certainly it felt it was a little nerve wracking from the standpoint of are we ever going to get this going? And, and, and unfortunately, as a result, when we got to the second half and watching through that interception, the collective Browns fan base all had the same thought in mind of here it comes. Unfortunately, uh, nothing came of it, um, which I think was a, a theme throughout this game, a sterling record of competence uh, across the board. In my impression was the Browns won all three phases of the game. Um, again, offense took a while to get there, but um, they did. But defense was phenomenal. Special teams, after the opening kickoff, they were not great on the opening kickoff, but after yep. that, they were awesome. Um, so that was something in the preseason. I was sort of like, all these people were freaking about Cade York, understandably. Uh, and I was sitting sitting there going, yeah, I don't know if any of the special teams look particularly good. And they were terrific after that initial kickoff and provided – a major advantage. And one of the reasons the Browns were one, it felt like they should be dominating the game. And two, 
was terrifying from the standpoint they weren't taking advantage of those opportunities because the Browns were on the on the Bengals half of the field seemingly the yes. whole game and the Bengals couldn't get out of their own end. So that was certainly a big difference. But just going into the defense, the defensive line is really, really good. It's fun to have professionals on the defensive line. It's fun to have Miles have friends. I think Miles is enjoying Miles having friends. I think Jim Schwartz enjoys that Miles has friends. The fact that you can put a defensive line out there uh, and have Miles Garrett stand up at linebacker and not be like, oh, crap, Miles is in at the end, so we're kind of screwed by moving him, and you're just like, oh, geez, everybody's going to in a world of hurt. Um, between doing some of that stuff, the 50 front that they put in a couple times with the five men uh, down on the line of scrimmage, uh, Miles was certainly feeling himself going with the uh, crossover up to the line of scrimmage before he blew up the backfield. They were playing incredibly fast, incredibly confident, and they felt like they could do whatever they wanted in some respects. Yeah, they were a lot of fun to watch. We saw glimpses, obviously, in preseason because we did actually have the opportunity to see some of the starters play, obviously, without Miles and what this new look could look like this year. And, of course, you know, the preseason, it's 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 tough to gauge just based on the level of competition that you're playing against. And that's where the question marks for me were. But seeing this live in person against Joe Burrow, and and yeah, I understand that it was sloppy in terms of weather and that that was an impact. But, you know, both sides had to deal with that. So to see them just like, I mean, the word that you used and it's fitting was dominant. That has not been a word we've used to describe this defense. Well, in any recent occasionally history. against the Bengals. That's the thing. It's weird. Joe Woods has a couple correct, of injuries. Correct. They just absolutely smoked the Bengals. But fair, it, fair. even in, even but with it still that, it wasn't like different. This. Yes, yes. Like it, it was, it was different because the games that I remember uh, as of recent when we did win against the Bengals, there were turnovers. Like we, yes. we, we had interceptions against Joe Burrow. Wow. Um, it, it just it looked very different from what we were used to. And to your point, like it was fast. They were physical. They were uh, there were guys flying all around the field. Um, the secondary covered the ball really well. I mean, the linebackers were so fun to watch. Uh, I mean, there were guys legitimately uncovered. And y- you alluded to that, Pete, really in the preseason of like that position group really having the biggest impact and benefit from this defensive line upgrade because these offenses are going to have to figure out what to do and and who to focus on in terms of getting stops because like as you could see like it's lethal depending on what you want to do um and and obviously like joe burrow he he looked uncomfortable he was under yes. duress almost beyond, the entire beyond the game. weather yes very yeah beyond beyond just the weather impact uh, i know that that didn't help obviously but yeah he he didn't have a ton of time he he couldn't process. He couldn't think. His throws were off target. I mean, he he was under pressure, and it was just a joy to be on the receiving side of it. And I will. I have to say, I was at the game in person, and of course, I go to sit in my seats, and there's four Bengals fans next to me. Now, when you talk about the level of disappointment that that was for me, I'm like, gosh, home opener. There were a lot of lot of Bengals fans. Yeah, there were so many Bengals fans there in person, and and it was really frustrating to see, just because obviously it's an it's a division rival. Uh, You know, we haven't had a home opener since when 2019, when we completely crapped the bed against Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so like that, like that was terrible. Uh, And so, I was anticipating really just a lot of energy and excitement from Browns fans. So. I had to deal with them next to me. And luckily they didn't have a ton to cheer about. And in fact, they left um, at the end of the third quarter. So they didn't, they didn't stick around long. Um, but yeah, I, I just like overall, like I think the expectation was that Bengals fans thought that this was an easy win for them. And uh, it completely was not. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of things with that. First, Orlando Brown is very high on Orlando Brown and in terms of like as, as, as a draft prospect, he tested about as well as the chair I'm sitting in athletically. And everybody was like, this kid can't, this kid, he just can't play. He proves that he can and earns lucrative, multiple lucrative contracts. So all credit to him. But he keeps talking about how he's done against Miles Garrett and talking about how he thinks he's done well. 
The numbers don't add up on that. And then, like, it must have been like the second or third of the play of the game. Orlando Brown's not that much smaller than than uh, Dewan Jones, and Miles Garrett fires off the ball and deposited his three hundred and sixty pound candy ass right into Joe Burrow's lap. And I was just like, okay, awesome. So, and then the other part is, and I've listened to like Bengals media, they're convinced they have way more talent than the Browns do. And I get it from the standpoint of Joe Burrow is a phenomenal quarterback and you're going top three, whatever quarterback. And Jamar Chase is one of the best receivers in the league. And T Higgins is a terrific player. But I look at across the roster and I don't see it. I think the Browns have a better overall roster. So the Bengals are like stunned. Bank, a lot of Bengals fans and are just stunned that the Browns could do them to, the, to this to them. And I don't think they really appreciate just how much better the Browns are from last year where they beat the brakes on them in Halloween to this year where I think the biggest difference. And like we talked about, I've, I've seen defensive uh, performances against the Bengals that were really good. But like last year when Isaiah Thomas blew by Jonah Williams, for a sack, you weren't expecting that to happen. You weren't expecting the tip, you know, Miles Garrett tipping the ball is not a huge surprise. AJ Green picking that off or some of the other plays you're sitting, you're, you're super excited to see it, but you're not sitting there going, yep, this is going to happen. The difference in this game was you were sitting there going, yes, Zadarius Smith is very good at football. I expect him to do those things. Dalvin Tomlinson and Shelby Harris should be able to hold up up front and make those plays. And JOK is flying around the field and looks great. And Miles Garrett's always going to be Miles Garrett. And Denzel Ward looks great. All these other things are going on. You're going, it's not a surprise at this point. You're going, no, they are a really good football team and they're just doing what a really good football team should do. So that stuff's very validating from that, that standpoint. I thought Jim Schwartz was phenomenal. We talked about it in the pregame. I think his consistent, just knowing who he is and having the experience he has and the expectations, everything was on the, on the same page uh, in a way that it, it wasn't last year or the previous couple of years, um, the front end and the back end always seem to be uh, in, in lockstep, which is super important. You know, they, they, there was a chart that came out and I apologize for not remembering the guy's name. He does really good uh, metric charts, but he said the Browns were far and away the best in the league that, that week in terms of coverage rate of plays perfectly covered 55%. And then at the same time, they were also the lowest number of plays that the opponent covered perfectly, which was like less than 20%. Um, so Jim Schwartz did a great job and Kevin Stefanski did a great job. So it just was awesome. And then I knew the Bengals were in trouble when uh, there was a particular toss play where the Browns were caught in the wrong defense. And they're literally trying to go, all these guys are trying to slant inside. And then immediately they still just chase down the toss and it gains no yards. You just, I mean, at that point, you're just like, they're in trouble. And my overall sense of this was like a lot of people were sort of sitting there comparing them going, Oh, Joe Burrow and Deshaun Watson were both struggling. Why are you getting frustrated with Deshaun Watson? Which we'll get to is that every throw save for a couple, uh, but from Joe Burrow, there's a corner there. There's somebody on, in coverage in the guy's hip making a play on the ball. And what made it frustrating with Watson is like, he was literally throwing bounce passes on some of these short hopping. And I get it. It's like the waterlogged ball was thrown coming out of his hand, like a center block, but like they were legitimately open and that was a key difference. So it felt a little bit a matter of when, as opposed to if, but still because of the, the, you know, the Jerome Ford fumble, because of the Watson interception, you're sitting there going, we're not getting these points at some point the Bengals may get lucky and get something. And then suddenly they're right back in the game, which almost happened coming out of the second half. You know, when, when the Browns are up 10 zero, they come out in the third quarter, immediately do nothing on offense punt. Bengals go right down the field <laughs> for a field goal. They get the ball back again off the, off the pick. They go back down the field. And then to me, what the biggest play of the game, uh, Grant Delpit, uh, third and five, the Bengals uh, have T. Higgins in the slot, and they try to go a fade, f- uh, slot fade, which given what they were looking at, I totally get it. You're one of your best receivers against the safety. You're going to take that shot. They try to throw it over his head. Grant Delpit never looks back, looks entirely at T. Higgins the whole way, and just managed to punch the ball perfectly to force a field goal, which then they m- then miss. And at that point, the game was basically over. The Bengals never had a shot. Uh, and, 
you know, Miles Garrett and Zadarius Smith were phenomenal, but Grant Delpit was playing out of his mind. Every tackle he was in on, he made. He timed up a blitz really well. He had his tackle in, for loss in the backfield. When he had to come down and make tackles on receptions, they were always short of the line, the line to gain. He wasn't, like, allowing more yards. Like, he had basically a perfect football game for him, and I, and I, I think it's the best of his career, which just adds to this thing. We talked about, uh, you know, we talked about breakout players, and, like, one of the things that we brought up was the possibility that because you have these defensive line that's so good – it's going to allow a lot of people to look a whole lot better. I think that's what you saw from Grant Delpit, from Martin Emerson, from some of these players. You're just like, wow, they look incredible. Well, that's refreshing to see. And also the fact that, to your point, we were so used to watching last year just guys getting wide open on this defense and then minds being blown when they're like pointing fingers and they look confused and there was just a lot a lot of that last year that that we had to watch and um, at one point I turned to my husband and I and I said to him I said wow this looks very different like there's there's not these instances where guys look confused lining up guys are like in the wrong spot and it 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 was just it was it was great. We had a competent football team. They they looked confident. They were f- the more physical team. Uh, they didn't let up, which is something else that I feel like we have gotten used to, where even when we have a lead, it's something that never felt protected or where we would really just kind of back off play zone, you know, try to try to keep everything like within bounds. And the fact that Jim Schwartz and company and team, like they didn't, they didn't take their foot off the pedal. I mean, like that to me in week one, like shows like this team is serious and like, this is the identity. This is what we should expect every single game. I know it's going to look different depending on the matchups, but Mm -hmm. like the expectation is, we have a top 10 defense in this league. And that is something that we should be seeing and we should be dominating teams that don't have a solid offense. So there was at least one major coverage breakdown where uh, a receiver got behind, I believe Denzel Ward, but Joe Burrow couldn't hit the pass because Dalvin Tomlinson is right in his ribs. Right, which is what we didn't experience last year. Right, that's exactly We had both things happening where there was no pressure and guys getting wide open. I mean, it was bad. Right. So now you have the situation where like you have a little room for air where somebody could, you don't want them to screw up, but it's going to happen. You're going to have a play that gets missed or somebody's going to fall down, whatever. Now the Browns have enough talent where they can clean up some of those mistakes. Well, and that's, that's the thing, situation. Pete. It, it all goes back to like, we don't need perfection. Like it's not, right. it's not going to be perfect. Like these things are going to happen. Right. Now to your point about matchups, there were a lot of things in Jim Schwartz's defense that were really interesting and stood out. So when Juan Thornhill was announced out for this game with the calf injury, you're sitting there going, coming into the season, you're sitting there going, well, they really like Grant Delpit, Juan Thornhill, and Rodney McLeod. So it would make sense they would want to try to get three safeties on the field. But you weren't necessarily sure how they were going to want to do that because they want to put so many corners on the field. Ronnie Hickman played 10 snaps at safety in that game. So they clearly want to have – more DBs on the field. And obviously that may change depending on the week, as you mentioned, but like Grant Delpit played nickel linebacker at points. Like this is the thing. Grant Delpit played all three safety spots uh, covered in the slot uh, played linebacker because the Browns just wanted to get more speed, more defensive backs on the field. So you ended up in a world where the Browns had in, in certain spots, one linebacker, five defensive linemen and five DBs because instead of worrying about, you know, per, you know, positions, you're worried about who are my best 11 guys. And they played a lot of that, which is really, uh, I I'm a fan of that. I, obviously I want you to put your best dudes out there for the situation. And then the other part of that is they rotated a lot of guys, not a single player on the Browns defense played every snap, um, which is unusual. Usually, I mean, usually at the very least your corners never come off the field, but they, they even came off the field a little bit. So they rotated a lot of guys. You saw a lot of guys like, they rotated their linebackers a little bit uh, they it, over the whole game they averaged less than 2 per play but nevertheless Anthony Walker JOK and Sione Takitaki were all on the field at different points and the thing is it never looked chaotic it never you never noticed in terms of 
oh, new new personnel is on there. Oh, it's gonna it's gonna fall apart. Or like in the past, Miles Garrett comes off the field and now your defense is just garbage. That didn't happen either. So there was a lot of those things where again comes Jim Schwartz does a great job. A lot of this comes down to just having talent, but marrying those two things made a huge difference for this game. And just like you said, just you ended up with a relentless defense that never that never stops and has that staying power. And what we ended up with at the end of the game and the thing we are all hoping for with this new defensive line is now you have a group that can close, that you can close out the game. The Bengals had like one last shot, uh, go for it on the fourth and four play, and then Miles Garrett just ends the game. Uh, comes off the the left side, his old buddy Jonah, who's never blocked him, uh, beats the double team and just in one foul, easy motion, just throws Joe Burrow to the ground and the ball game. That was it. Might have been the most exciting play I've ever seen in person. I mean, it just just the experience of the rain just sticking around the entire game that, mind you, no one was prepared for. I mean, I looked at the weather report before heading up to the stadium and it was 15% chance of rain. It, it showed a cloud. It was a little gray cloud, Pete, but there was no little raindrops on that gray cloud. Uh, so it didn't rain here. I can tell you that at all. I did. I don't think it was raining a block away from the stadium. It mm-hmm. truly was just a circle going over the stadium, which so I feel like just the whole setting and the scene, because in the second quarter, a lot of people didn't stick it out they were seeking shelter just because because there wasn't really expected rain happening people weren't prepared uh i i would really love to know how many ponchos they sold that day um at 20 dollars a piece i don't know how much they are i i but they're overpriced um so <laughs> <laughs> i i was sitting there thinking like i wonder how many ponchos they have sold today they they, they definitely made a killing and they definitely didn't have enough inventory um but uh, so no one was really expecting the rain. So there, there were a lot of people that had funneled in in the second quarter. And also it wasn't super exciting because there wasn't a lot of offense being played. So, yeah. so there were a lot, of, a lot of factors happening. But then at halftime, the rain seemed to have let up. So everybody funneled back into their seats going into the third quarter. And then at that point, obviously, it, the game was still really close, as you had mentioned. And so when the Browns took that lead and it felt like the Bengals became desperate, the stadium was pretty full. So it was like the setting of it's still raining people being like cold and gross, but also this like excitement, like, okay, if something major happens here, like we, we got this, like this game is ours. So like, it was amazing. And I have to call out my husband because He went and got pizza during the third quarter, never came back to his seat. So I'm sitting there soaking wet, mind you, next to my Bengals people that were still holding out hope and next to two drunk guys that that I didn't talk to. So I was I was by myself. I experienced that moment by myself and I was so mad at him. But anyway, um, pretty electric, like the stadium was just rocking. Um, It was so loud. And that was incredible Uh, that that just like Miles Garrett was the guy to to close the game. Essentially, he, he really put a stake in the Joe Burrow coffin. And especially considering that miles gets so much critique just about like, where's miles. He doesn't show up for big yeah. moments. I mean, that was as big as it, as it could get for the home opener. Which is funny because like you go back to the Buccaneers game last year and he did the same thing. Like people <laughs> have the worst memory when it comes to this stuff. They do. Yeah. Look, and the thing is like, I think, there was a feeling that he was going to make that a big play somewhere just to close that because that's what he does. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise, but um, notably loud roar uh, when that play happened, like everybody knew that that was it. Um, and they closed out the game. They, you know, at that point at the, the Bengals threw up the white flag and took Burrow out. Um, but as far as the weather goes, they were messing around with him the whole game. Glove, yeah, they, no glove. Uh, his gloves. <laughs> no, I know. I did yeah. notice that in person too. I mean, my my husband said to me um, as we were sitting there watching, he was like, he he was like, his hands are too small to throw in this weather. He was like, he was like, Bri, he was like, it's gonna be fine. Like, stop panicking. Like, he he's not gonna be able to throw the ball this game. And alas, he was right. Yeah, um, you know that's that's one of the games that you, you go back to the old combine measurements and people go up oh, nine inch hands. <laughs> Listen, um, that's my favorite part of the combine is the hand measurements. Yeah. So look, I mean, you got a complete game from from the Browns. Um, I, I think they played 
great on that side of the ball, but I don't think it was like the Chicago Bears game where it was like historic. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. one of those where it just felt like everything was going perfect. I think the Browns were just good and yeah. played at a high level relative to being good rather than this felt like a fluky situation or they just caught them on the wrong day or whatever. And like I said, I think if the weather was clear, the Browns defense was still going to be just wreak havoc. Maybe the Bengals score more points, but I still think it would have been well in control. Uh, I think it was just going to go that way. And the Browns, look, even when the Browns had a miserable defense, they still often had the Bengals number. Now they have a good defense and just added two things that make the Bengals uh, struggle anyway. Uh, and, And look, the question that's going to be asked every week, is can the opponent in this case could the Bengals protect Joe Burrow? No, that's going to be it. You have to add now. That is a thing you're going to have to deal with with this defense, which is really fun for me to be able to go. Can this def- can this offensive line protect against Joe Bur- or protect against the Browns' defensive line? Because most of the time the answer is going to be no. And if yeah. you have that, it just gives you a yep. massive, massive advantage. Um, offensively, I think Kevin Stefanski had a fantastic. Wait, Pete, can I pause you for one second yes, before you move to the ahead. offense? I did notice, and I don't know if I, I'm not sure that I caught on the broadcast if they talked about it. I did notice that um, they were using signs for the defense. That's something that Joe Woods never did, right? Like holding up the actual signs. I, I uh, sit across from the Browns bench, and they had like the big yellow signs with like numbers and like different things on them. I you see it in college all the time. Yeah, but here's the thing: like, you never know if they're actually using them or not. Maybe the Browns are. I, I was, I, yeah, I was just, I was curious because that was definitely something that um, was very noticeable if you were paying attention to the sidelines of um, like scrambling to hold up signs and change things, etc. Yeah, I mean, if they're actually using them for calls, it's an, you know, in some ways, it's an advantage to be able to get your guys to make sure they know the call. But at the same time, like theoretically, you could. Uh, the other team could sort of figure them out. So you can sort of exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, what you end up with is sort of a situation where like you could potentially be have signs and signals and a call in the headset or whatever. And on any given situation, it could be like any one of those things is the actual way to go. So got it. Uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see if that continues as the season progresses. Uh, offensively, uh, Kevin Stefanski, I thought had a great game plan. Lou Anamarumo is a really good defensive coordinator, but I thought the Brown or the Bengals safeties were going to be an issue. Uh, the secondary very young, uh, for the most part. And, you know, I, just the, the Browns have been able to give the Bengals problems. And I thought they did that a lot in this game. Uh, Bengals came out really well early stopping the run uh and and sort of that first series or two you sort of like Oosh, this is gonna be a slog and it was um but i think the browns were you know in terms of what kevin Stefanski was calling and trying to get done like plays were there to be had um sometimes the Bengals were just winning or sometimes it was a lack of execution uh it took certainly the thing that took the longest to get going was was nick chubb the Bengals came in clearly and the weather obviously played a role in that where they were going to do everything they could to stop Chubb. I think the Browns were smart to have Deshaun Watson take a couple of shots down the field, even though the weather was miserable just to keep them honest. And they had an opportunity to complete a, a, at least uh, one or two of them um, before they finally got the one to Elijah Moore that uh, Marquise Goodwin shot. They took, uh, he, you know, he had him beat and the Browns just missed it. I'll be curious to see if that's something, whether, you know, so they're going to keep taking shots to him. It's just a question of how they're going to do it. But I think that had an impact. I think the, the, the Bengals had to sort of be a little honest to that just because given the way the, the game was scored, uh, for so long, I mean, it was three to zero for a while, um, that one play was going to be all it took to sort of break this thing open. So they had to be at least a little honest to it, create um, some running room underneath, uh, short passes and some of those things. So I liked what I saw from that standpoint. Um, the th- stuff that stands out uh, is the fact that the Browns don't keep a whole lot of guys extra into block on passing. Uh, like in this sort of, I think Deshaun Watson, in a lot of ways prefers it to, that way. The, the Browns use a lot of empty, uh, which is a sign that they have a lot of confidence in him. 
but it also means that the the defense knows you know where where the court you know who's going to get the ball unless they do some motion type stuff uh, that you are basically saying to the quarterback if you don't get the ball out you have this much time to get it out before the defense is going to get there um and obviously it was a little bit of a mixed bag Jedrick Wills I know people are going to criticize him he didn't play particularly well but Trey Hendrickson's a really good player and asking him to single block him that much was going to end badly at some point and it did a couple times I also think Watson holds onto the ball too long at times I think he sacks himself in some ways which is something he did with the Houston Texans this isn't a new thing but it it did get to be a little frustrating on some of the ways he was trying to hold the ball or run himself into contact when lack of patience or whatever is still getting used to the feel of things. I'm hoping that's something that improves because obviously at one point he took that shot to the ribs and he's sitting there bent over and you're sitting there a little, at least a little worried. You didn't think it was coming out, but she's a little worried that it's game one. We've got to make through 17 of these um, that, that you're seeing him get whacked as much as he was. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts here. Um, one thing that I'm definitely not used to that's going to take some time getting used to is actually having a mobile quarterback and one that uses his legs um, because I find myself, like, quite frankly, holding my breath every single time he takes off just because the defense wants to hit a running quarterback. I, sure. I mean, like, you give yourself up at that point. So that that's going to take some some getting used to. I mean, I mean, I know it's a threat and it's a benefit just from an overall standpoint because he has the ability to make plays. And um, that's something, again, that we just really haven't had at the quarterback level. Uh, so so that was like a big eye opening moment for me overall. Um, I think I texted you at one point that I was ready to tell Jed Wills he he needed to walk home. Um and <laughs> well, you stopped yourself because you, it was there was a flag, it, there was a penalty, flag yes. on, a, on a run play and they got a big gain and then like they they ultimately said it wasn't a penalty and at that point you t- <laughs> to me if that was if he got called for that I was gonna t- I was gonna tell him he had to walk home <laughs> um the thing is like he was pretty good in run blocking like again I know PFF isn't very kind to him on that But like, I thought he did okay on some of his run blocking stuff. And like people complain about effort and some of the other stuff. Like he plays, he doesn't quit. uh, He just, the body language kills him. Yeah. And, and two, I, I just feel like this team, this offense, there's so many really good pieces and to have a left tackle that's going to be inconsistent is frustrating if that is what we are up against for the rest of the season. And now I get it. He's going to have some of the, some of the hardest matchups that he's going to face uh, and still getting used to Deshaun Watson at the quarterback level. But you know, that's something that I really just, I don't want to have to have these conversations week over week, just about his inconsistency or lack of effort, if you will, uh, because that that's going to be frustrating to, to deal with that. Um, Some of that is like, You know, and you saw this if you watch the Jets game. This was a huge problem for them for the four plays Aaron Rodgers was on the field. Um, You have when you call a blocking scheme, like it's designed to work for a certain amount of time. And if you call blocking scheme, it's supposed to be basically catch step throw, and the guy's just sitting there holding on the ball, like you're blaming the the tackle or whatever. Clearly, the the, it wasn't designed for that, or the quarterback runs into it, Um, and that's unfortunately you know been a thing with Deshaun Watson. He's you know know, with past quarterbacks, they aren't they get the ball out faster. Um, for the most part. Now, some of that is ultimately going to lead to good things, and Deshaun Watson's going to be able to extend plays and make plays doing that, but it's a mixed bag. Um, so it, it's a lot of stress on the linemen. And like Jed Wills had the worst game, but I don't think Ethan Posick played particularly well. And some of that's because DJ Reader's really good. And yeah. then, like, but, well, but DJ Reader wrecked the game last last yes, year. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I, rem- I remember that. Um, and part of the problem you run into is like the Jed Wills, like, slander is out of control i had somebody try to blame jed wills for jack conklin getting hurt like oh well i could i mean i could see why they why they put that out there i mean that that was just a really unfortunate incident well of if how you're an offensive tackle and you get the guy going up the field your job is to then t- push him past the quarterback and ride him out which is exactly what he did unfortunately conklin's coming inside with his block and it just happens right. that Trey Hendrickson continues to go and just goes right into his knee 
and it just immediately collapsed and you knew he was he, writhing on the field. It was awful. Uh, I feel awful for him because he was hard. Players were crushed. Um, Kevin Stefanski was devastated with, with the injury. Um, and you know, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, this, this keeps happening to the Browns with the offensive line where something happens early in the year, um, with, with, with somebody. And then they're, they're, they're sort of, their depth is already gone, uh, before the season barely started. Now, fortunately, Dewan Jones, um, was outstanding in pass protection, He's got a lot of work to do as a run blocker. It's going to be difficult given the way he plays. I really like his movement skills. He's not slow by any stretch, but he's going to have a difficult time picking up some moving targets, I think, on some of the the run blocks that they do. Um, So it it was rough, but under the circumstances, he did a great job. And ultimately, if you're choosing one or the other, I would – I will – live with guys who don't run block very well if they're excellent pass protectors. And as long as Dewan Jones continues to do that, great. Um, as far as Deshaun Watson, miserable performance for the most part. And some of that, yes, un- undoubtedly due to the elements. Um, however, after some early, early in the game, I thought Deshaun Watson was dropping his eyes and looking at protection a little bit and not seeing downfield, uh, which was not good. I think that got better as he got more comfortable. I think he got noticeably more comfortable as the game went on. And even though the ball was short hopping some of his targets, his eyes were getting to the right places and he was throwing to the right targets. And I know it's frustrating, you know, as, as I noted while watching the game, it was frustrating watching him miss open targets. You're sitting there watching this game and you're sitting there going three zero. Like we need to, you know, we're wasting all these opportunities. Eventually they're going to be able to do something, but like, one, Kevin Stefanski is, again, able to put a quarterback in the right position to make plays, which is what he does. And two, the quarterback was trying to go to the right plays. Uh, other than the interception, which was a tip ball, he wasn't putting the ball in danger. Like, he was throwing two spots that made sense. He was trying to get two open guys. So a lot of that was productive. Um, and then, ultimately, for for one thing, it, it's sort of, like, annoying that, like, Deshaun Watson, like, is as poised as he is that he will smile when shit goes wrong. And you're sort of like, you want to get mad at him because he's sitting there with a grin on his face. But that poise proved out to be really helpful uh, at the last drive of the second half when he did get the, you know, did get that shot to the ribs. And then he delivered about four perfect passes in a row before the Browns made my favorite play call of the day where they went shifted to quads and went quarterback trap, uh, got the Bengals defense completely out of the way he runs. He's got to make one block or miss. Uh, or he just got to read one block, and then he gets in the end zone. Like that play call was awesome to be able to call Q trap uh, down there when the Bengals were were trying to stop what they thought was a pass play. Um, so look, you, you, you if you're trying to grade this, you're, you're certainly not going to go. All oh, the Browns won because of Deshaun Watson. They didn't lose because of him either, which is uh, important as well. It, again, not a good game. I think. The signs are there that it's going to get better and hopefully starting this week because we don't want to be in a situation where now we're, you know, you're basically like the Jets are now where you're sitting there going, the defense has to win every game just to hold down long enough for the the rest of it to figure itself out. So hopefully I, I have reason to believe that those things are going to improve pretty quickly. Okay, so a couple of thoughts on Deshaun from um, my perspective. You know, I've been pretty open on this podcast of just having doubts being a big question mark for what we were going to get from him this year. I was getting ready for the game and I was talking to someone and they were asking me about Deshaun specifically. And I said, you know, all I hope is that he doesn't treat this game as a moment to try to prove himself or do too much because I could have anticipated like coming off of his six games last year and the uncertainty and the, and the critique that he got last year, like wanting to prove who he is and like showing up for this home opener specifically against a division rival and like really being like the guy. Uh, so that was like my fear going into this game that if things weren't going well, he was going to try to force, force it along with your thoughts. I agree. I felt like the start of the game he was a little bit skittish, uncertain, unsure of, of himself and of how everything was was happening. But then as the game wore on, I'm with you. He felt 
better in terms of decision making, um, trusting in what he was seeing. Yes, it was frustrating that some of the throws were off target and he was missing wide open guys. He also had situations where he had the ball right on target and guys dropped the ball, which was also incredibly frustrating. So yeah, my man, David Bell. Oh, P, my goodness, he hit him right in the chest. That's and then like we were waiting for that. We were waiting for a great pass. And he finally gets one and boom, right off, right off his hands. And exactly. Everything. So I think when you combine those two things together, it kind of like all came to a boiling point. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure the fans were booing Deshaun uh, for one of those in the in the dirt passes. Um, and for me, this game was really hard to evaluate just because weather was such a factor. And I hate that we don't know still uh, the only thing that yes. I will go off of. Yeah. I, I just hate that. It, I mean, much like the preseason where it was like 100%. one drive to evaluate this. Yeah. I mean, this game was very similar in a sense that I don't know how much we can take away with it based on the weather factor. I mean, from all of the national media and coverage from this game, nobody has let that what happened on Sunday dictate how they feel about Joe Burrow and the Bengals. Let me just let me just say that right no, now. You're right. There you're was right. zero doubt or question that this was an anomaly for Joe Burrow and that this is not going to predict how the rest of the year was going to go for him. Deshaun Watson did not get that same level of respect in terms of nobody came out and said Deshaun Watson wasn't great, wasn't the best. But there was no hope for him in terms of like how people were evaluating his play. Uh, so I think the only thing we can go off of at this point is he looked better, felt more comfortable. He did make some great, he did make some some great throws. I mean, the the pass to Donovan Peoples Jones. Yes, 100%. Um, I mean, that that is something that I can say that we really don't see a lot of that. We haven't seen a lot of that in our time watching Cleveland Browns quarterbacks. Baker Mayfield had, had moments for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that that was something where I was like, wow, like there was nowhere else he could have put that ball. And and props to Donovan Peoples-Jones for making the catch and coming down with it because he knew he was going to get hit. And uh, so, so that was great to see. Once again, Mr. Reliable, DPJ. I thought that was his best throw of the game. Uh, and it wasn't because it was the most difficult uh, because I think the Elijah Moore pass was probably a better pass, but it was because the ball was coming out of his hands like shit. Like it could have been, that could have very easily been a pick pick where the, suddenly the ball comes in his hand. It's weak. It's underthrown. Yeah. That guy comes underneath and just picks it off, but it got right over the exactly where it needed to go. Got to Donovan people's Jones and yes. And that was the drive. That was that touchdown drive. You had yep. to have those plays. So good on him that he stayed engaged. He didn't allow it to sort of like, take him out of the game. He stayed with it poised and was able to make those plays. Like that's let's, let's, let's contrast that. And, you know, because as you mentioned, Joe Burrow gets all the benefit of the doubt. Somebody who doesn't right now at coming off the game, he just had is Josh Allen, who I thought lost his poise, but yeah. he's a guy who's now all these people. Going, I don't know. You know, even though he's been as successful as he has, he's getting that same treatment as, as Deshaun Watson is in some case. And I look with Deshaun Watson, I get it. But at the same time, like I'm sitting there going, as we all were going, can we please get an answer to this? Like, is he going to be that guy? You know, is he going to give us indication that he's that guy? And you get this sloppy, rainy mess where you're sitting there going, I don't know. So I agree. Again, I think there were positive signs, but overall it was very frustrating. What was not – here's the thing. Like, after all the talk about – What's this new offense going to look like? And all this stuff, well, you know, you have people like Tony Gross going, uh, Nick Chubb's going to just disappear from the offense. I don't know if they're going to even use him anymore. Um, there are definitely things that are different about this offense and some of the things they're doing. But ultimately, Kevin Stefanski's not stupid. He knows what he can do and get back to just running the football. And the Browns, it was weird because the Browns and Bengals just both kept running counters at each other the whole game. But they just got back to their pin and pull game. Wyatt Teller and Joel Batonio were phenomenal in this game. Wyatt Teller looked like the Wyatt Teller, you know, we we had gotten used to, who's uh all pro caliber type player, like just rolling people uh as a blocker, kickouts. Obviously, he had that big block on the on the trap that allowed Deshaun Watson to get in the end zone. He had another big block to get free up Nick Chubb on a run. And ultimately, like we did get some unique usage or different usage. I was really happy to see Nick Chubb catching balls on the move 
because so often like he's you know in, in terms of their screen game and stuff it always he's often just stopping and catching the ball which he's good at he's often had a little trouble with catching balls on the move and he did that a couple times early in the game in this awful weather uh and was great and it was just like a little extra thing you got into this game that allowed him to continue to be a different part of the offense where it's not like a true carry it's not like a traditional touch where he's got to go through 11 guys. Now it's just catching the ball, working to the sideline and getting out of bounds, like that type of stuff where like that just allows you to get a little extra Nick Chubb, which was really good. In addition to the fact that he just ran hard and did what he does. And ultimately like for all, again, all the talk about, well, what's Nick Chubb going to look like in this offense? Well, he looked like Nick Chubb, except just a little more than he used to. Yeah, it it brings you back to what you said at the beginning where Bengals, media, team, fans. I'm, I'm <laughs> I know lock, Lockdown Bengals, I heard you. Plus, plus we work for the same company. <laughs> Surprised at just feeling like the Bengals have more talent. When you really break it down position by position, like there isn't there, there, there's actually not a comparison. I mean, Nick Chubb was a huge upgrade when it comes to just looking at the overall running back position. I I mean, thank God for Nick Chubb in some instances where he's able to make those cutbacks and just truly change the entire outcome of a play um, and be able to get positive yards at certain things that feel like he shouldn't have any gain, if not a loss of yards. Um, And, you know, I, I, I know we haven't talked about it all that that much but like adapting and adjusting and a game plan that they weren't anticipating a full-on rainy conditions um, on both sides you know I think there there were a lot of questions on Kevin Stefanski going into this game and you know Zach Taylor I know that they've been to the AFC championship they went to the Super Bowl um, a couple years ago Uh, I was never super impressed by Zach Taylor but uh, Kevin Stefanski in in my opinion outcoach Zach Taylor and company. Um, And to me, that was also something like very positive to see in totality with the adjustments being made uh, because Kevin's been criticized for that as well, like not making adjustments, not pivoting based on what's happening. Um, So like for me, I know we wanted the offense to come out and look, you know, completely different and evolved and Deshaun Watson throwing the ball and seeing all of these fireworks and plays and whatnot. But I was happy. I mean, I mean, we, the team did what they needed to do in order to pull up the victory and they did enough. It was enough. That's all we needed. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed the chess match between Kevin Stefanski and Lou Anarumo. Like uh, there was a play where the Browns had trips to the right and they tried to swing out Nick Chubb and you're going, this play got blown out of the backfield and you're like, Ooh, that's a bad play call. And what actually happened is the Bengals had a, a, a four man front, like really a five man front. And as soon as the ball was snapped, uh, Sam Hubbard flew out to the flat and just took away the play. Like it was just, it wasn't a bad play call. It's just the Bengals had the right defense. Uh, meanwhile, I think overall that, uh, that, that Kevin Stefanski, as he has in the past, was able to set things up throughout the game. You saw some of the things he was trying to set up in terms of, different concepts and building on those things and having running a play that gave a certain look to come back to something else over the course of the game, which you ended up with really just setting up the counter game and some of those things. But like, like, you know, again, going back to that chart, only 15% or like less than 20% of Brown's offensive plays were perfectly covered by the Bengals, which is just a testament to being able to do that. It also helps that the Browns have a lot of talented players that can do those type of things. Elijah Moore getting a carry in the backfield, you know, being able to turn all the way around and go the other side of the field was pretty, pretty good. There's just a lot of things where you're looking at this and you're going, he, they're, they're always working and always trying to figure some stuff out, uh, which I found to be a positive. So it was, it was good to watch that. Um, the, you know, I can complain and say there are things I wish I, 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 I we see more of, particularly, I just want to see more David Njoku in the offense. But again, that comes down to rainy, ugly weather and not not having that ability because and David Njoku is a phenomenal run blocker and was certainly an asset there. But like he's just really good at the ball in his hands. And that's sort of like 
a good problem to have that the Browns have enough weapons. Amari Cooper got a lot of targets. DBJ only got like a couple. Uh, Elijah Moore had a little bit of opportunity, but like you're sitting there and you're going, here's a great player who did not get the ball enough because they're trying to get the ball to so many great players. I can live with that, uh, you know, as so long as they keep winning. And I think j- j- based on history that like there are going to be games where one guy is just going to crush it and other guys may not get the ball as much. Uh, and then it just sort of depends on the game. Uh, I've always thought of his offense as sort of a uh, Bruce Lee sort of flow like water, take what the defense gives you type thing. If the defense going to take one thing away. He's just going to sort of lean into something else that they're not and just keep gaining yardage, which goes back to that 2020 team, which had garbage receivers for the most part and yet succeeded. Yeah, I would I would say, too, that we've seen with Kevin Stefanski even before because of that there are certain games where different players will be featured based on the matchups. Um, and, and I'm also okay with that. I, I hope obviously uh, with the talent that we have, that we, we see some of those breakout games for specific players and everybody is okay with that on the team. And that there's, you know, no, none of them being upset based on like targets or touches or, or whatnot. Um, and hopefully everybody is involved and getting action and the offense truly becomes, you know, a high power, high point, high scoring um, type of offense. I mean, I mean, we definitely have the tools to be able to do that. Uh, I, I, we didn't obviously see that in week one. And then, you know, the other aspect that, that I'm glad we saw and it took, you know, it took a while to get going. It was frankly a struggle bus game for him was Jerome Ford, but, and I get it. Like, he did not look good at points. The fumble was bad. Um, the Bengals just ripped it out. Obviously that killed you on that drive, but they didn't quit on him and he didn't have a ton of success. And then finally he had that big long run and you sort of had that. Okay. Because they need that to happen. Like this is the thing that people don't realize. Like Nick Chubb was on the field and got a whole lot of touches in this game. And yet I think Jerome Ford still had 13 carries. They ran the ball a ton in this game. They ran for over 200 yards. Uh, the Bengals only gave up one hundred one one hundred yard rusher all last season. Nick Chubb got there in one week, but they also had other guys. Deshaun Watson's part of that; he's running the ball. But Jerome Ford plotting away a little bit. And frankly, I thought he looked like Kareem Hunt, both in in the sense of not in the passing game because they didn't throw him the ball, but in terms of just blind, <laughs> just blind trying to just reach running into box. running into a wall <laughs> yes and I, you know there's one run where like you ran to the back of dewan jones i'm fairly sure the reason wasn't i think ford was actually right and jones was wrong but nevertheless it just looks bad when you're right. it's just <laughs> slamming into the biggest person on the field as if they can't see him so look he missed all that preseason i'm sort of you know i i'm, I'm basically willing to sort of see this one out i think he's going to get a lot better the funny thing is like, and I've had a lot of people tell me this and part of it's the number, but Jerome Ford is a big boy. Like he, there are a lot of people who are like, they thought Nick Chubb fumbled that ball because honestly, in person, I didn't realize that that was Jerome, Jerome Ford. I thought it was Nick yes. Chubb. He's a big kid. Like, and that's yeah, the thing. And, and you saw when he finally got out on that one run, he got some juice. He can get out there and go. So like, I want to see him get better because I do think that becomes a really interesting dynamic. If they get both those guys going and suddenly it's like when Kareem Hunt was at his best in 2020 and a little bit of 2021, where we're not sitting there counting carries and worrying about what where Nick Chubb is because you have somebody else who can step in there and produce. And that's going to be critical going forward. So I thought that was also important. Yeah, well, it was funny. I don't know if you listened to any radio on Monday morning, but there were people literally clamoring to have Kareem Hunt back again. I was told about it. Yes, uh, <laughs> my reaction is just like, Ugh. It's like, he wow, we we really do have we really do have short memories, though. Yes, well, <laughs> first world problems, but like Kareem Hunt is literally hoping somebody will offer him slightly more than the minimum. That is all he's waiting. I'm surprised the Ravens haven't reached out to him. Well, they may need to. Um, yeah. The uh, the last group where the Browns dominated, like I said, after the opening kickoff uh, coverage was special teams. Yeah. Um, they created a whole lot of hidden yardage between punt coverage and getting decent returns and just winning on that front. And then obviously, look, it, you know, all the consternation about kicker and Cade York and all the struggles. And after the first kick, 
from Dustin Hopkins, you sort of stop thinking about it. You're like, okay, it'll go in. Even as ugly as the weather was, you're just like, oh, no problem. And none of the kicks were like an adventure, nothing weird. The fact an that the adventure. Bengals are the only <laughs> – I mean, so often it just like the only uh, the, the miss kick came from the other team, which is also weird. I, you know, my my unsupported theory is that having real defensive tackles impacts that. But it never felt like work. It, it, it all felt like it was pretty easy. And the fact that the Browns special teams and defense were so dominant allowed the offense to take their time. And even though, you know, like we talked about in that third quarter, you had that little moment, you're going, oof, here we go. They ultimately closed the door, allow the offense to take over, and then obviously the Browns get enough uh, between the three field goals and most notably two touchdowns compared to Bengals no touchdowns. Uh, yeah. They took control of the game and won outright, which is important. So it's fine, Pete. You can say I was wrong about the kicker. I told Pete I was wrong, wrong about the kicker, and he told me I'm still right. You're still right because the Bengals scored no touchdowns and the Browns scored two. Pretty simple. You win. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the the other part of that is like here, you know, because everything's going to be an evaluation of Kevin Stefanski, everything. Uh, and as you've talked about, if things go wrong, there's there are two people left to sort of blame at this point. One is Jedrick Wills, who's yep. going to be taken no matter what. And then the other is Kevin Stefanski. And like. What are the things that are important to being a head coach? One, the quarterback position. And one, another one is who you hire. And right now, out of the gate, Kevin Stefanski looks pretty good getting the guys he wanted in those jobs at defensive coordinator yes. and getting uh, Bubba Ventrone in there at special teams c- coach, even like after a while. And you started, Mike Prefer just started hanging out. And then evidently, because of the Colts' stupidity, allowing Bubba Ventrone to be available and <laughs> Kevin Stefanski at an awkward point in the hiring process told Mike Prefer hit the bricks and hired, hired, uh, hired Bubba Ventrone to come in. It's just like, look, he's better. We're going this way. Yeah. And through one game, it was great. So I, I, all the credit to him on that front. So like, and the other thing I would mention along with that is the fact the Bengals have arguably been the best team in the AFC North for the last past couple of years. And Kevin Stefanski owns the Bengals. They are zero and four in Cleveland. Yeah, uh, they're one and one or one and uh, one and two at at their their place. Um, that should matter. That the Browns just absolutely destroy the team. The, what is supposed to be the best team in the AFC North, and that's the fact of the matter is like when we previewed, and I said the Ravens would finish fourth, which I feel good about. The Steelers finished third, which I feel really good about. And that it's going to come down to the Browns and Bengals. Like this may be what ultimately gives the Browns an advantage. They're not going to see the Bengals again until week 18, but unless something major changes, I think the Browns are still going to have a major advantage in that game. They are just a really good matchup for the Cincinnati Bengals. I can't believe I didn't even kick off the show with this, but we talked about it on Friday. The AFC North is ours for the taking. It truly is now. Well, Uh Yes. No, th- it, here's the thing. It is. If, if if we win on Monday, I'm going to get super chesty in a hurry. Listen, listen, I have never wanted to win a game so bad. I mean, since 2020, when we played the Steelers in the playoffs, but I want to win this game. I, I want to win this game. So I want them to win this game so bad on Monday night because it, th- this is so stupid to be annoyed by, but after the victory on Sunday, I, I still feel like, everyone is hesitant to call the team good. Mm -hmm. If they win on Monday, that's not, it shouldn't even be a question of how this team should be discussed in being a good football team. Like they, they should be part of the conversation already. They're not fine. Go in on Monday, beat the Steelers. I mean, the Steelers on the, on the flip side of, of the Cincinnati and Cleveland matchup, the Steelers have had the Browns bag forever. Like the the record between the Steelers and the Browns, it's 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 not a good one. Uh, so I feel like what a statement that would be to turn this thing around and and really come out with a bang for the season, being two and zero to start the season against two division football teams. Yes, um, although Kevin Stefanski's record against the Steelers isn't bad. They've been sort of back and forth, basically one and one a couple. Uh, multiple times i know but like just like but no, I, I, like, no there's still that there's like this like big brother little brother thing sure. I, I don't know what, that, i don't know what it is but I, I hate it i hate it 
while the Browns were dominating the Bengals, uh, the Steelers were getting the shit kicked out of them by the San Francisco. That was Bengals. that was probably like the second best part of the day was like just checking in on the Steelers game and and just seeing how terrible they were. Like just we- they couldn't they couldn't block. Sunday was so good. They couldn't do anything. Kenny Pickett's 158.3 quarterback rating the preseason went down by about 150 <laughs> points. They deserve um, it. He got smoked, uh, could not function. And not only that, like the Steelers lose, uh, they, their defense couldn't stop the 49ers either. But not only did they lose, it's bad enough they lose that opening game, which has sent Pittsburgh into into all kinds of wor- uh, worry and a death spiral. Campbells. Which is, by the way... I love it. I welcome it. You you mentioned how like there were a lot of Bengals fans in the Browns. There were a whole lot of 49ers fans in the Steelers. Yeah. State. But uh not only did they lose, it would be you know bad enough to lose and be 0-1. Uh even if you know the, the 49ers beat them by 50, they would still take one loss. The problem is the Steelers came out very hurt in that game. Uh, yeah. they're gonna be without Cam Hayward for this game. They're gonna be without Deontay Johnson for this game, and they've got four other guys who are at least some level of hurt, but they expect to play, including Pat Fryermuth. I think one of their offensive tackles, a couple other guys. Cam Hayward, I think, is going to end up in the Hall of Fame. Has been an absolute nightmare for the Browns forever. Yep. Uh, other than the playoff game where the Browns just beat the shit out of him for some reason, I still can't explain. Michael Dunn. Uh, that, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, just whoop, whooped him, and I still don't understand why. But nevertheless. He's such an integral part to that interior of the defense, uh, defensive line, which enables T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith to be so dynamic on the outside because they don't have to worry about it. Uh, they can always just they can just play out there. Um, it gives them a lot of freedom to do that. T.J. Watt still played really well. He had three sacks and two forced fumbles, even though Steelers lost. Um, but that puts them in in a, in a bad spot. Keanu Benton's going to have to play more. A guy a whole lot of people on uh, Browns fans wanted in the draft is playing great for the Steelers, look good. But their their depth is going to hurt there. And that, you know, after they just got ran over by the 49ers, the Browns have to feel pretty confident between behind their guards that they can do the same thing. Meanwhile, Kenny Pickett loses his top receiver. Uh, Kenny Pickett, who did not play well. Uh, Kenny Pickett, whose offensive tackles are not good, who just have to watch, who just watch the San Francisco 49ers beat the brakes off them, now has to go, has to go watch the tape of what the Browns' defensive line just did to the Bengals. That's a very spicy meatball for the Browns because, look, they have all the incentive to work, win this anyway. It's a divisional game. It's the Steelers. They hate the Steelers. And to your point, that's the one that just sort of hang, you know, just means a little bit more than the other ones within the division. But if they win this, they are 2-0. They are 2-0 in the division. The Bengals and the Ravens also play this week, so they're going to beat each other up. And all of a sudden, like you said, if the Browns come out and win this, and maybe the Ravens beat the Bengals, then they're both 2-0. But the Browns will have won two of their six divisional games in games that, you know, I sort of projected they'd be going 3-3. Three and three. That's a big advantage. And to your point about people not believing, it's funny. In like March, I think the Browns Super Bowl odds were like 40 to one. And then like last week, they were 33 to one, at least for one betting site. Today, they're 18 to one. So Ooh. it's creeping up there. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not going to tell your mom to bet every but, but I, My mom's already at Family Dollar downtown yeah. putting her bet in uh, for the season. But it's interesting, you know, Vegas doesn't care uh, about whether they, they're they just going to go by that. So, look, I, I do think the Browns have a huge opportunity there. And, and Cam Hayward potentially might miss both games the Browns play against them, which would be certainly beneficial for them. But, like, yeah, Steelers- take advantage. Take advantage of this. Like, the, to your point, like, the Steelers are beat up, like, emotionally and physically. And the Browns are coming off of a, a really solid victory, feeling confident going into this game. I if they come out and lay an egg, I would be shocked. Like that, that would be the old Browns way to do things. But I don't know. It just, it, it felt different. I, I feel like this team is motivated. I feel like they believe in themselves. I feel like just overall, like they looked and played like a unit. Like I, I know it's silly to talk about like body language and chemistry and like all of those things, but like they there's truly some, there's some looked- merit to it. They looked like they were having a blast out there. I mean, I mean, they looked they they looked they looked so different from from what what we are used to. And and I think we all wanted to think 
that Baker was that type of leader and brought everyone together. I, in what I saw on Sunday, and yeah, I get it's one game. Like I, I, I don't think we could be farther from 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 the truth on that. Like I truly think this unit like respects both, like both sides respect each other wholeheartedly. Um, that that was palpable in, in my opinion. Well, here's the thing. Like in addition to the fact, that I think during the game they were fired up, especially the defense. Uh, I, the defense was having the time of their life. And then after the game, what do you get? You get all these players just losing their shit, celebrating. In fact, do you, I've, I'm sure you've seen the yeah, how you were probably in the sweet uh, enclosed uh, box that uh, Zary Smith was yeah. trying to break into. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was not. <laughs> uh, but like that, that did not feel fake in any, that, that did not feel contrived in any manner. They felt like genuinely them coming out after all the buildup kind of keeping quiet for most of the off season and just being able to go here we are i do think it's you know obviously they've got to be able to keep that focus that momentum i don't think they're going to lose against the steelers and they go back to last year where you know they come off that heartbreaking loss against the jets and then they come out and they beat the steelers certainly i think they're going to have that fire and that intensity the the, the interesting part's going to be how do the steelers respond because at the very least their fan base is already desperate uh, this feels already like a must-win game for them. And in, in, in many ways, it could be. Now, certainly, you can point to the Bengals being 0-2 and, and going to the AFC Championship, but, like, the AFC is so loaded that it's, like – and, like, somebody was making fun of me. It's, like, I pointed out that, like, any t- any AFC team losing to an NFC team is a big deal, except for this 49ers because they're, like, a legitimate contender. But, like, the NFC is viewed as the inferior conference, and if you're losing games to them – it like it's a major disadvantage because you need all of those and then to try to do as get as many wins in division and in conference to try to make the playoffs. Like there is some part of me, and I think the Browns are a good team. There is some part of me that's thinking one down nine to go, just because of how densely packed the AFC is and how loaded this team is in like, you look at the Aaron Rodgers situation and the jets and like just how big of a letdown that is for them because the jets even with Zach Wilson, if that's the way they stick, uh, you know, whether they bring in somebody else, like everything else about that team feels like a playoff team, except for the fact that everybody else is so good that all these other teams are, are vying for spots. And you're sitting there going, what seven teams are going to make it out of this conference to make the postseason? And that's like a really difficult thing. So it makes all the bigger difference that if the Browns can go two and zero and put the Steelers at zero and two, that's a huge advantage to be two games up on them two weeks into the season with, uh, you know, then getting to go play a Titans team who I, I would like to think the Browns are just straight better than before they get to go to the Ravens. Like that becomes a major opportunity. And we're sitting here going into this going, I really hope they come out of this like two and two, you know, one and three would suck, but like they could survive it. But now you're sitting here going, okay, if we go two and zero, then suddenly we're talking about three and one or four and zero. Yeah, let's get nuts at that point, and all of a sudden you're going, "Look out! This team is going to be a problem, and you have to take them very seriously." Angry elves, Pete. The angry elves. Well, speaking of elves, first, Rich Eisen way back in like May talked about how the Bengals were going to come and dance on the elf man. Then you have Jamar Chase talk about how, calling the Browns elves. And his thing after the game was just awesome. <laughs> him, him, them go, we lost to a bunch of elves. Because <laughs> that is right in your wheelhouse to I be one rivalry and two still petty in massive defeat. The fact that they're still, you know, they're still adding a little more fuel to this this thing for the next one. That, you know, this is going to come back up at the end of the season. Well, so I, obviously. I love it. Uh, listen, the fact that he was like still salty about it after and like still harping on getting beat by elves as if like yes. the Browns proclaim awesome. themselves as like little elves is hilarious to me. Uh, and I, I feel like I want the players to just like really like play this up. Like if someone can show up pregame in an elf costume, like do it. Secondly, the fact that then like you have players <laughs> going on Twitter saying Cleveland is Cleveland and then like they're quote tweeting each other like Cleveland is Cleveland. I mean, like just inc- like inc- I'm here for all of it, here for all of it. <laughs> but if they all dress up like elves heading into Pittsburgh, like that will literally make my day. This is funny on a number of levels. First, I think Jamar Chase has sold a bunch of uh, merch with the, with the brownie on it. 
Um, and I suspect the Cleveland t-shirt industry is going to be ready to go uh, with wh- everything regarding Cleveland is Cleveland. And Cleveland Elks. is Cleveland. <laughs> uh, all those ready to go for by the time the Browns are back in town. But what's really funny is I know who the person is inside the Brownie costume. Uh, you do? They, yes, I do. Uh, which is really funny that like potentially that that is like a, more business uh, for for more popularity for that mascot. Amazing. Is going to be interesting. So, yes, I love all of that. You know, and, and that's the thing, like. If the Browns go out and lose this game, it's going to feel it, it's not certainly not the end of the world, but it's certainly going to cheapen what they accomplished week one, which is always the case. Like if you go out and like sort of, you know, I don't want to say the Browns are, you know, are an overwhelming favor, but it, because it's a divisional game. But at the same time, like they are the favorite, like Vegas has them getting or giving points, even though they're on the road, all these things. And like, this is a big opportunity. And if they let this one get away, you're sort of like, that's that's a pretty big letdown, even though, you know, going the season, we would have been perfectly happy one and one. I think I think the way they played changed that dynamic. And I think I, I feel good about them playing this game at a high level. There's certainly matchups that they're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to figure out a way to block TJ Watt. But just overall, I feel really good about how this team played. I feel like what they did is sustainable. I feel like they can grow on offense and I feel like they're going to get better. I look at the Pittsburgh Steelers and I certainly think they're not going to be certainly not as bad as they were week one. At the same time, I do see some issues where I don't think they can fix the problem in a week. I I think that offensive line is going to be a problem for them. Um, I think the interior will be better, but I think those tackles are bad. Um, And we've, they've been living a lie like that. And I'll be curious to see if they put the rookie in at left tackle, which let's go make his first start in front of Miles Garrett. Worked great for Ike Aquanu last year, gave up two sacks against in the Carolina game. So I just feel really good about where they're at uh heading into this game and like making this into a thing where like, you know, it, the era of unbridled enthusiasm for this team and like what it can do and sort of being able to get past the past 18 months and what last season was and just being able to be like finally it's you know because I do think there's a, I think the way the Browns won was super helpful, but I, there is always this sort of feeling of people are hesitating to get too excited because they don't want to, you know, turn around, lose this game and just sort of be like, Oh, I got my hopes up again. I got to get crushed. I think it's going to take a little bit for people to figure it out. And that's the other part about it. If they win, I'll be very curious if there's, you know, any, if people are selling their tickets, those next two games. Yeah. I, I, number one, I think it's going to be a fun game. Number two, I, I think the narrative coming out of the game, even if we win, is going to be, well, the Steelers are just bad. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm good, with, yeah, I'm good I mean, with people just saying the Steelers are bad. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it, too, because like at the end of the day, like we've lost to teams that were worse than us plenty of times. So uh, whatever, like I really, I really don't care. I just, again, like going into week two, I don't care how you win. Just figure out a way to win. Like we should win this game. We're a better team talent, talent wise. And I think we have the tools and the coaching staff to essentially exploit the other team's weaknesses. Like there, there's no reason that we should be losing these games. Yes. One last thing I got Brie texted me last night and was like asking, should I, should she get a Dewan Jones uh, Jersey to which my response was, does her son need a tent? So and she responded by saying that they should only sell it as is in his size. Uh, so I'm curious for, uh, from from listeners, if they want to comment or whatever, to what kind of things you could do with a full-sized Dewan Jones jersey. If it's just a blanket, if it's a tent, if it's a... No, I want people to actually wear them. So when you're walking around the stadium and you are seeing other Browns fans, you see what it looks like on all different sizes. Like for me, it would be all the way on the floor. I mean, it's probably dragging. Definitely all the way on the floor. I mean, I get it from the standpoint. uh, The the thing is, would it be the length of the jersey or would it be the, the material, the width? It's it gotta be both. Coming down. It's, gotta, it's it's gotta be both. I mean, like I could put a belt around it, make it a poncho kind of thing. Uh, you know, you gotta style it to make it your own. But like, I think that would just be qu- comical if it was only in his size. Yeah. Well, and then you can you know 
make it into a, a, a one piece little, little thing. Well, that'll be interesting. I do think he should get into some serious uh, out of the box merchandising opportunities, just taking advantage of his size. For example, you know, you, the, the overpriced ponchos could have easily just been Dewan Jones. <laughs> Dewan Jones jersey. Uh, I love him. He's yeah. so sweet. We need to protect him at all costs. He's just a sweetheart. Well, I hope we don't have to at 374 pounds. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, as always, you can uh, like, subscribe, comment. Certainly, uh, we always appreciate feedback. You know, like the YouTube page. It's certainly helpful. Uh, just any way you want to support, tell a friend. Uh, and other than that, like, uh, certainly we are fully, fully out there, excited for this team, looking forward to what we feel should be like a, a big opportunity to win. And if we do, uh, I, I promise it will only get chestier from here in terms of talking shit and, uh, confidence, but, uh, should be a lot of fun. Anyway, we will be back hopefully next Tuesday. We'll see, uh, based on the Monday night game, certain people may have, have gone to sleep by that point and have to catch up the next day. I'll be taking notes still on Tuesday. Fair enough. Anyway, uh, so we'll talk next week.